Good afternoon. I'm Campbell McCrary. I'm a vice president capital markets at Anvest Capital in New York. Welcome to the Anvest Capital Inc. live webinar with Battle North. Ba uh, Battle North trades on the TSX Venture is BNAU and on the OTCQX is BNAUF. Hope you'll enjoy today's program is also available in replay mode. Do feel free to chat in your questions in the question pane of the GoToWebinar control panel or simply email them in. We'll try and get to the questions in real time or after the webinar. Abbas Capital is a New York-based specialist investment management and corporate finance firm focused solely on the natural resource sector. Uh, please note this call is for informational purposes only. Uh, we have with us today presenting uh, George Ogilvy, who is the president and CEO of the company. Uh, George uh, is an engineer by background and has more than 30 years of management, uh, operating and technical experience in the mining industry. Previously, he was the CEO of Kirkland Lake Gold, where he and his team improved operations at the Makasi Mine and elevated the company's profile with the acquisition of St. Andrew Goldfields. Prior to this, he was the CEO of Rambler Metals and Mining PLC, where he and his team guided the evolution of the company from grassroots exploration to a profitable junior producer. Previous firms include Anglo Gold, Hud Bay, Dynatech, Rambler, and so on. Following the formal presentation, members of the Amvest Capital team will ask questions of management. We also look forward to any questions that uh, will be sent in uh, from you, the larger listening audience. So uh, George, if you could share your screen. We are. And uh, can you hear us? Excellent. Yes, I certainly can, Campbell. Thank you. Well, thank you ever so much for the opportunity to present to you today. Uh, since we last spoke uh, to you and your uh, listeners, uh, we've made uh, considerable progress. Uh, this presentation actually is on our website, so we do make some forward-looking statements. So I draw the, uh, the listeners to the cautionary statement, which they're welcome to read at their own discretion uh, on our website. Uh, the value proposition uh, with respect to Battle North Gold, well, I believe that we have an accomplished management team uh, with a proven track record of turning around uh, difficult assets and broken stories. Uh, we now have an extremely strong uh, balance sheet with uh, 67 million Canadian dollars cash in the bank and an extremely strong institutional uh, shareholder registry uh, consisting of some blue chip institutions. Just in the last week, uh, we've released a very robust feasibility study, which is a maiden feasibility study for the project with uh, our maiden reserves. Very strong economics, um, yet we utilize uh, very conservative gold price and exchange rates when compared to the gate today's spot prices. As everybody probably knows, uh, under the former guise of the company, there was significant investment. So today we have significant infrastructure already in place, substantially permitted and essentially shovel ready, that once we green light the project, we can see first production within seven months. We have massive tax loss pools, which have now increased to 704 million Canadian dollars essentially meaning that we won't pay any corporate uh, or income tax on this project throughout its life of mine. We've also started to pay attention to what we call the string of pearls. These are close proximity targets, which could provide incremental growth, additional ounces uh, over our initial uh, five years of mine life, which are not built into the current feasibility study. And of course, we're located in a tier one mining jurisdiction, Red Lake, Northern Ontario. Um, I've shown this slide before, but you'll notice that we've added in some additional management people. I'm also showing Eric Setchell, who is our general manager in Red Lake. Uh, Eric is a 30 year veteran of the industry. Uh, for the last 15 years, uh, he's worked extensively in the gold industry predominantly in underground mines. He's been a key to our success over the last two years and will be a key player, obviously, as we move forward into the construction phase, pre-commercial production uh, development, and then into commercial production in 2022. 
We've also recently added Nick Hayduk to our ranks in the corporate office. Nick is our internal counsel. He brings 20 years worth of experience with him from Lundin and Kenross uh, Gold. We're also in the process of looking to recruit a senior HR manager uh, to the company. And we're also in the final stages of trying to recruit a regional exploration manager, uh, which I'll talk to a little bit later on in the presentation. So we've spoken about the balance sheet. Now, um, of that $67 million cash in the bank, $10 million of that has to be allocated to the regional exploration program as the monies were raised using a charitable flow through. So they can't be allocated to the Bateman Gold project itself. So that means we have approximately 55 million Canadian dollars that can go towards the project. The funding requirement for the project shows 93 million Canadian dollars, which essentially means that we have about a 38 million Canadian dollar funding requirement or gap. I'm happy to advise that of the groups that we have in the data room, both private equity and commercial banks, the company is now in uh, negotiations with several of those debt providers with respect to a 50 million US dollar uh, term facility. And we strongly believe that once we file the technical report accompanying the feasibility study in late November, early December, shortly thereafter, we will be able to announce a fully funded uh, solution to the project. We now currently have 129 million shares issued, fully dilutive, about 137 million. Share price today, open trading at $1.90, giving us a market cap of 245 million. We're very pleased with the appreciation of the share price, but compared to our peer groups, we are still significantly undervalued. And we trade today at around 0.3 times price to net asset value. Typically a company in the development or early production stage should be looking at a 0.6 to a 0.7 times PNAV. Eight analysts covering the company with target prices ranging from $2.75 to $5.50. That's after the project financing. And as you heard me say with the debt component, essentially what I'm saying is the equity component is done and we're not coming back to market. You can see the blue chip institutional shareholders there on the right hand side, Sun Valley, uh, Franklin Tech, who recently came in on the last bought deal. Between the three of them, they would control approximately 30% of the share capital of the company. So here you can see on the left-hand side, uh, the high-level KPIs, uh, key performance indicators that came out of the feasibility study. The base case gold price use in the financial and economic model was 15.25 US dollars an ounce, still some $400 US below today's spot prices. Using a 0.74 exchange rate to the Canadian dollar, the after-tax IRR was just over 50%. The NPV on the project with a 5% discount factor after-tax was around 305 million. And we had 420 million Canadian dollars in real free cash flow over an 8.2 year mine life. Remember, that's two years more than the 6.2 years we were showing a year ago in our preliminary economic assessment. If you run the model at spot prices of 1900 US dollar an ounce, the after-tax IRR approaches 86%. The NPV on the project is 531 million, and there's close to 700 million Canadian dollars in real free cash flow. That's about $100 million of free cash flow on an annual basis over a seven year, seven years of commercial production. And you'll also notice that at 1525, there's still $406 million of unused tax pools. 
Here you can see the production profile, very similar to what we put out in the PEA a year ago. So the average annual production is around 80,000 ounces of payable gold out the back end of the mill. The throughput over the 8.2 years averages 1,300 tonnes per day, with a peak approaching 1,500 tonnes per day. That's quite important because remember, the mill is permitted for 1,250 tonnes per day, but it's actually designed, built and constructed today for 1,800 tonnes per day. So we see an opportunity here to get additional uh, tonnes, incremental tonnes to that mill with incremental ounces that would have significant margin. We'll speak more to that later. The all in, uh, uh, the C1 cash costs, 613 US dollars an ounce. The all in sustaining cost around 865 US dollars an ounce. And the all in cost, including the upfront capital, taxes, corporate overhead, GNA, of about 1,010 US dollars an ounce. Those compare very favorably with the PEA that we put out a year ago. You'll also notice that there's a pre-commercial production period, which is on the left-hand side of that uh, bar chart. 48,000 ounces of gold is produced over a 21-month ramp-up period to the declaration of commercial production. Let's talk a little bit about the upfront capital and the sustaining capital. So the PEA had 101 million Canadian dollars of upfront capital. The feasibility study is showing 109 million, which includes a 10% contingency. Most of the monies goes into underground development, approximately 50 million Canadian dollars. And that's to push out the capital development in the mine nine to 12 months ahead of the mining crews when we declare commercial production. Remember, that's very important for this deposit because we have to come in and infill drill this deposit off on 10 meter centers to move everything into the proven category as far as reserves. When we do that, we're going to have uh, unplanned surprises, positive surprises, and we'll have unplanned negative surprises given the high grade nuggety style nature of the deposit. So under that scenario, however, we would have 40 to 50 mining stopes opened up and a lot of optionality and flexibility to deliver five and a half gram diluted head grade material to the mill. There's 34 million that has to go in on surface consisting of raising the tailings pond dam by a couple of meters. There's a septic field bed system to go in to treat the gray water in our 200 man camp. There's an ammonia reactor to go in on surface so we can discharge from the pond below 10 parts per million of ammonia. And there's a primary crusher to go in on surface housed in its own building to, uh, to deal with, uh, to mitigate dust and noise. Beyond that, there's also our own EPCM, engineering procurement construction and management team it's going to cost us about three and a half million dollars over the course of 21 months. Now, over that period, there's a working capital requirement, which today in the feasibility is showing at 62 million. There's a 3% NSR on the project, 2% to Franco, 1% to Royal Gold. That's what we see in the 1.7 million. And then with 48,000 ounces of gold at 1525 US dollar gold price and a 0.74 exchange rate, it gives us about 98 million Canadian dollars in revenue from gold sales. So that means over the 21 ramp up period, there's $34 million of positive cash flow from operations. We deduct that from the 109 million of upfront capital it gives us 75 million. We then add in about $10 million for inventory to uh, do first fill in the mills with all the chemicals and the ball mill, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, replenish the warehouses and bring in some critical spares. And then there's $8 million on top of that to run the corporate office uh, GNA out of Toronto, some additional people and a little bit of an increase in office space 
So that's what gets us to the $93 million funding requirement. And I explained earlier how we were going to make up that approximate $40 million Canadian deficit through the debt financing. The PEA showed about $30 million a year annually over the commercial production period, which was uh, five years. Obviously, here we're showing seven years and 188 million sustaining capital works out at 27 million Canadian dollars per annum, which again is bang in line with what we put out in the PEA a year ago. So here you can see on the right hand side a schematic of the layout that comes out of the feasibility study. The purple is already a sunk cost. So remember, we've got a 720 meter deep shaft with a full hoisting system, 10 ton skips that set over the cage, 14,000 meters of lateral development within the mine. The light blue or the cyan color you're looking at there is the pre-commercial production development, which is about 8.6 kilometers. And with unit costs between five and $6,000 per meter, you can work that out. That's what brings you close to that 50 million Canadian dollars of upfront capital in underground development. We've set the development rates at a conservative five rounds per day over the entire life of mine or 18 meters at peak. I believe it's 24 meters per day, which is approaching about six and a half rounds, but a very conservative schedule. The feasibility study envisages the critical path items starting up the 1st of April of next year and seven months to first ore on the ground means that we have ore in front of the mill in November of next year. Now, if we produce a technical report, which is approved by the board of directors, along with a fully funded solution by the end of the calendar year, we will have the ability to start some of the critical path items three to four months ahead of the schedule that's currently in the feasibility study, which means that first ore could be on the ground as early as July or August of 2021. So as I said earlier at the start of the presentation, we've now generated our first reserves. As you can see, we have three and a half million tons at a diluted grade of five and a half grams going into the mill, which uh, gives us 635,000 ounces of reserves. If you factor in a 95% metallurgical recovery, 5% going to tails, it's about 603,000 ounces of payable gold over the entire 8.2 year life of mine. Now, the good news, is that we still have measured and indicated that didn't convert into reserves and we still have inferred material that can be further infill drilled moved up into m i and potentially over to reserves the key point to note on this page is that the reserve calculation was done using a gold price of 1375. if we were to apply the reserves at 1500 US dollars an ounce gold, we would find that some of that measured and indicated material, i.e. that 350,000 ounces that didn't make it into reserves, is likely some of it will convert over using a higher gold price, but still a gold price which is significantly low below today's spot prices. So if you ask me today, what's the true life of mine of this deposit with no exploration success, but only infill drilling success at the historical conversion rates. We're looking at a mine life between 10 to 12 years with an 80 to 100,000 ounce annual production profile. Uh, further upside, um, you saw from the production profile that the mill is not being fully utilized. We're about to produce our first 43101 on the McFinley deposit which is tied into the upper part of the Bateman Gold project. And a little bit further afield, but within a kilometer of the shaft in the mill, we have the Penn Zone. We're intending to put out a 43101 compliant resource on Penn early in 2021. And we think over the next couple of years, 
there's the opportunity to bring some of that incremental tonnage into the mill and push up our margins. The project is quite sensitive, obviously, to grade and tonnage. So, for example, if we can increase the tonnage by 10%, it improves the NPV on the project by 20%. So if we can find an additional 150 to 200 tons per day, that would add in and around 40 to $50 million of additional net asset value to the project. Here's a photograph looking down on site. Um, as we said earlier, we spoke about the mill. There's the shaft. We have a permitted tailings pond. There's a 200 man camp, which we are preparing as we speak for the first 100 beds. And in the back, right-hand background, you can see the Koshna head frame belonging to Evolution. And in the center of the page, you can see the Red Lake uh, mines that Evolution uh, uh, now owns 100% of. This is a photograph looking inside the, uh, the mill. The mill, which is in the foreground, would be our sag mill, feeding into the ball mill in behind it. When we ran the mill in, um, the summer of 2018, we've received a 95% metallurgical recovery and 43% of the gold came off with uh, gravity, which comes from the two Nelson concentrators on the upper right-hand side of the photograph. So here you can see the impact of the tax pools and over the life of mine, because we have these 700 plus million dollars of tax pools, it actually generates about 162 US dollars an ounce in free cash flow. So fairly significant. Now, at 1900 US dollars an ounce, the full $704 million of tax pools are fully depleted. However, because we put in new capital and additional sustaining capital, there are still approximately about $140 million of tax pools remaining after 8.2 years. Now, it's not in our DNA right now, but over the course of the next 18 to 24 months, as we put this mine into commercial production, we do not want to be a single asset company. And we see ourselves being able to utilize those tax pools to maybe help us look at accretive merger and acquisitions of other assets, preferably being in Ontario. So here we're looking at the string of pearls. The red vertical line would be the Bateman Gold uh, shaft. The red horizontal line is an exploration drift we have on the 244 level. Now, the McFinley deposit uh, has a non-compliant resource today of 67,000 ounces at 6.8 grams per tonne in the ground. That's only ever been drilled off historically down a couple of hundred meters. We're now in the process of turning that non-compliant resource into a compliant resource and expect to put out the 43101 sometime in December of this year. And where McFinley gets interesting is that, as you can see on the 685 level, when we poked out a 700 meter deep hole a couple of years ago now, we didn't just go through some mineralization, but the same stratigraphy, lithology, structure, mineralogy is what we see five and a half, um, 550 meters higher up in the package. So now potentially we've got 500 meters of open plunge length adjacent to a full production shaft and a big hungry mill sitting on surface. The same is also true for the pen, the carbon and the island zone. On the Google map on the right hand side there, the gray area would be the water. And you can see that historically they were drilled by the former management team. The pen zone, this is the first time we've drilled this deposit from actually the underground workings from the 244 level. And of course, all the drilling that we're doing is orientated drilling that was never done in the past. You can see some of the historical drill assays, plus some of the new hits that we've seen with respect to the most recent drilling. And this deposit, like McFinley, has not been cut off across strike, nor has it been cut off at depth. And it's only 500 meters away from our expiration drift on the 244, which will have a ramp access right to surface in front of the mill. 
So lastly, the regional land package, as you know, we have 28,000 hectares in Red Lake. It would be represented by what you see there in the dark blue. Notice how it butts up or is adjacent or contiguous with the areas which are in the red or the light pink. And those belong 100% to Evolution Mining, the new Australian mid-tier market cap company that came into Red Lake in April of this year with the acquisition of the Gold Corp, Newmont Gold Corp assets. We've drawn a 10 kilometer radius out uh, from our uh, project, and you'll notice how it encapsulates some significant producing mines. Now, in 2017, we conducted a full review of our regional land package. Today, we have all our claims prioritized. We have high level work programs, plus we also have costs associated with that. And as I said earlier, we have $10 million in the bank today that has to be spent on the regional land package before December 31st of 2021. Two or three weeks ago, we applied for permits that typically take about 30 to 60 days to gain, but that would put us in a position, if granted, to conduct a winter drilling campaign at some juncture before the end of February when the ice has formed on the lake and some of the winter roads are in place. And as I alluded earlier to the start of the presentation, we're now in the process of hiring a regional exploration manager who's gonna manage that entire program for us. Given the success that companies in Red Lake have seen, particularly, for example, Great Bear Resources with their Bonanza grades coming out from their Dixie project, if we were to see any similar to success with respect to that, given the uh, geographical location of the mine, given the credibility of the management team, given that at the end of the year we would have a fully funded project and we'd be well on our way to first production in the first and second half of next year, I really think that if we have regional exploration success, it could absolutely ignite a fire under the share price long before time. So just to summarize then, very accomplished management team with a proven track record of turning around broken stories, difficult assets. Sure, you would agree with me, a very strong balance sheet now with strong institutional blue sh uh, chip shareholder support, a very robust feasibility study built off of sound engineering principles, relatively conservative. And if you start to consider today's spot prices over the next two to three years, the economics look extremely attractive. There can't be many other projects in the world that are shovel ready and can be in production within 12 months from today. Massive tax pools, which are gonna be hugely advantageous to our shareholders given we won't take pay tax and could be hugely strategic when it comes to M&A activity. We think there's a lot of organic growth in the shadow of the existing head frames. And of course, there can't be many safer jurisdictions than Red Lake, Northern Ontario, that's been around for 80 years, third, fourth generation miners, and almost 30 million ounces of gold has come out of this camp uh, within that time period. So that concludes the formal part of the presentation. And um, Campbell, I'm happy to, uh, to move over to any Q&A. Thank you, uh, everyone who, who sent in questions so far. Please uh, find your way to the question pane of the GoToWebinar control panel and or email them or chat them in. Uh, and uh, let's get started. So um, the big bear in the room, uh, elephant in the room, any chance a corporate partner uh, might show up and then or maybe just uh, rather than a bank might cover the debt needed to get fully uh, financed. Yeah, it's a good question, Campbell. I, I think when our technical report is filed on CDAR, I would expect there's probably going to be a lot of corporate development teams that will be looking to download that document and, and review it, you know, in fairly short order. Um, although we've seen an appreciation in the share price, which is welcome, as I said earlier, we're still very much undervalued compared to our peer groups. And of course, if that valuation gap is is so big it may just attract somebody to come and take a much closer look you know at the company but i want to be very clear here 
we believe the best value for the shareholders of Battle North Gold is what I call the go it alone strategy. We have the management team with the bandwidth and the experience to put this mine into commercial production. I believe over the next two to three years, gold prices are gonna be extremely robust. We will generate significant free cash flow and given the close proximity targets and given the regional land package that uh, we have and can explore upon, I think that represents the best value for the shareholders at today's current share price. Is there any immediate, um, uh, might there be any immediate synergy to extend, uh, combining, consolidating with, with your neighbors? Um, yeah, look, that's a great question. And absolutely, the, the issue we have at the moment is if we were going to do any M&A deals ourselves, we certainly don't have the cash in the bank, so we would have to use our paper. And if we were looking to do a deal, given how undervalued our company is, it would be extremely dilutive to the current shareholders of the company. But in 12 to 24 months time, with first production and gold dory bars being poured, and once the, market, once the market has confidence that you know, we can deliver five and a half gram material to that mill, given the legacy of what happened in the past, I would be expecting a big re-rate in this company. And when that happens, I think we could then be in a position to do more of a merger of equals, which would then make perfect sense because combining uh, uh, companies and assets in Red Lake is what Red Lake really needs. We don't need a dozen or so groups up there all fighting for you know, uh, access to pools of labor or capital or you know, working with the same vendors but not getting the economies of scale. It really does need a consolidation in the right order at the right point in time. How much additional resource may or might there be deeper in Bateman? How much could the satellite, the pearl, string of pearls add to the annual production? Yep, well, we know right now between the inferred and the MI that didn't make it into reserves, there's about 600,000 ounces there. And conservatively, we believe that at least half of that could eventually make its way into uh, the life of mine plan and reserves. And that's why I said earlier, you know, 300,000 ounces at 80 to 100,000 ounces is somewhere between a three to four years of additional mine life with no expiration success. Former management drilled this deposit off to 1,600 meters below surface, and it was never cut off at depth. So even today, we have another two to 300,000 ounces of non-compliant resources, which we call explore, that are actually on 100 meter drill density, so they don't make it into the inferred category, which has to be between 40 and 80 meters. So this huge upside there, in next door, when Gold Corp discovered their high-grade Red Lake discovery, it was all made below 2,000 meters. So this deposit is demanding that it actually be drilled at depth. We just don't have the resources to do that from surface today. And it's going to take a little bit of time for us to put the capital development into the mine that will allow us to put drills underground at the relevant uh, elevation to allow us to drill 2,000 meters below surface. Back of the envelope calculation on Bateman and McFinley is that probably the resource that will come out between those two um, uh, deposits in the next three to four months, probably gonna be somewhere around 150 to 200,000 ounces of compliant resource. But remember, that's only from surface down a couple of hundred meters and the deposits have never been cut off uh, below or at depth. And we know McFinley has mineralization down another 550 meters below where we, we had formerly been drilling. Thank you. Thanks to the presentation, George. Um, so the, the PA was released last year in August. Um, you know, what, given the final feasibility out, how, how was it different to your expectations back when you released the PEA? 
actually the the feasibility study was a great result for us nine times out of ten when companies move from a preliminary economic assessment to a pfs and then a feasibility study which is a lot more detailed level of engineering which requires quotations and and formal bids etc cetera, etc cetera, you normally find that the capital cost increases exponentially as does the working capital and the economics are not quite so strong when you're dealing with real numbers in PFS and feasibilities when compared to the PEA. That didn't happen in this case. So the IRR after tax for the PEA was 40%. With this feasibility study at 1325 US dollar an ounce gold, which was the gold price we used in the PEA. So comparing apples with apples, we're at 32%. The reason for that was there was a $10 million increase in upfront capital and a little bit more monies in working capital. The NPV for the PEA was 135 million after tax. For this project, it's about 176 million. So an improvement of $40 million on the NPV at the same gold price and exchange rate. And then the free cash flow for the PEA was $192 million over 6.2 years. And for the feasibility study at 1325, it's about $230 million. So again, a $40 million improvement when compared apples to apples at 1325. So we're, we're extremely pleased with the results of the feasibility study. Now, given that this is what's known as a class two engineering study, which means the cost estimate is within plus or minus 10%. Yeah, that's that's great. And what were some of the key like sensitivities in those positive differences? Yeah, well, I mean, obviously we spoke about throughput. Uh, throughput, the project is quite sensitive to throughput, and it's obviously very sensitive to grade. And uh, as I explained earlier on in the presentation, the way to mitigate the uh, impact of the grade is to have the capital development nine to twelve months ahead to allow us to do that further infill drilling and move all the reserves up into the proven category. So right now, I think we've got about 135,000 ounces of reserves in the proven category with the drill density is on eight meters. But then behind that, there's 500 odd thousand ounces of indicated that moved into the probable category with a drill density of 19 meters that needs to be tightened up to 10 meters. And we've built that cost and scheduling uh, into the feasibility study timing. Yeah, okay. And then the recent financing, you know, 45 mil originally and got upsized, um, you know, how much of that is allocated? Was that allocated to repay the sprot loan and then regional exploration and then yeah, capital so for the project? Yeah, so the, the $93 million we require, as we said, we have $55 million cash in the bank today, which can go to the project, right? And that $93 million includes $8 million for corporate overhead and G&A. So that leaves us a funding requirement of about $38 million Canadian dollars. The term sheets the company has in front of it today from multiple potential debt financiers is for 15 million US dollars. So that's approximately 65 million Canadian dollars. That's well in excess of the 38 million dollars funding requirement we need for the project. Over and above that, if we took out Sprott loan facility at the end of the year, we would owe them 15 million Canadian dollars. But that's why we're also looking at a 50 million US dollar facility because anybody coming in providing us with debt is going to want to see senior security over the project and its assets, which currently right now resides with the Sprott loan. So they're not going to want to see that pari passu or be subordinate to any other debt provider. So when we put this debt component in, whoever is the successful party, that then allows us to take out that uh, that Sprott facility at the end of this calendar year. Yeah, got it. And then and just the, on the, the well, the other the other upside there, Stu, is 
you know, for the 48,000 ounces we're producing starting in the second half of next year and going into 2022, all of that revenue is derived from a 1525 US dollar gold price. So we know gold is being tightly sort of range bound at the moment because of the US election. But I strongly believe whether it's Trump or whether it's Biden, the gold price is going to start running next year, probably even more so if it is Biden and there's a three to four trillion, <laughs> trillion, trillion stimulus package. So that's another almost 500 Canadian dollars per ounce margin on 48,000 ounces. If my math is correct, if we deliver those ounces, that's an extra $25 million in revenue from gold sales right there, which again, can easily cover off the, um, the, the, the current existing loan if it doesn't get taken out by year end. Yeah, the result's gonna be interesting, but both would be good for metals. Um, and then just one last quick one before I pass to Artie. Um, what was the breakdown of the, you know, the final number you raised was 61 million Canadian, roughly, what was the breakdown between existing shareholders, you know, topping up or staying pro rata versus like new investors to the story coming in? Uh, I don't know the exact number off the top of my head, but it was probably 70% existing shareholders topping up and then 30% uh, new shareholders coming in. I think the, the the new one on the registry that we were very pleased to see was obviously Fidelity. Fidelity out of Boston and Fidelity out of Toronto uh, both took a significant uh, pos new position in the company. And as I said, you know, with Fidelity and Franklin in there and uh, Sun Valley, those are blue chip uh, institutional shareholders that you normally wouldn't see in a explore exploration company uh, pre-production. Pre so they're more typical for seniors and, and mid-tiers. And I think that tells you a lot about where this project is now as far as how it's been de-risked and the credibility of the management team. Yeah, you definitely would have an enviable uh, shareholder register compared to some other peers out there. Thanks for that, Artie. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, why the current permit of the mill is less than its capacity? Well, that that belongs to the uh, the former management. That's how they uh, they structured the uh, the application. So it's twelve hundred and fifty metric tons per day. We we spoke about um, earlier on maybe applying to get that amended, but without having a feasibility study and without understanding how it would impact the closure costs, um, we really didn't want to take it on because the government agencies would ask us questions that we, we just didn't have the answers for. So now that the feasibility study is completed and we know how long the mine life could be and how much waste rock we're generating and where it gets stored and how much goes on surface and how much stays underground and how much tailings we're putting the pond and how much excess capacity do we have. That's why we wait until first year of commercial production. At that point in time, we've got two years of history on the project with running the mill, managing the tailings pond, 300 people on the payroll, strong positive economic benefits to the community and the stakeholders in Red Lake. We go to the government agencies and we apply to get the permits amended up to potentially even 2,500 tons a day. It doesn't have to be 1,800 tons a day, it might be 25. We give them that plan and we have all the information to share with them and we then give ourselves 12 months to get the permits amended up to a much higher number. And that's why in year two of commercial production, we start to show about 1,270 metric tons per day, taking it through the 1,250 metric ton per day on average uh, permit that we currently have. But it, it's not an aggressive timeline and it's very, uh, very doable. And given it's Red Lake, you know, we're talking third, fourth generation miners. It's a very pro uh, mining community and uh, we're only dealing with the provincial regulators we, we think if we're well prepared and we present a good plan, 
uh, we will have our permits amended in the next couple of years. Thank you. Uh, is your is your uh, underground mining methods uh, require backfilling to each stop? And and when when do you think the backfilling uh, plant will be operational during the ramp up? Yep. So there's four mining methods that we're deploying on this deposit. Uh, the two principal mining methods would be sublevel long hole and uh, uppers retreat. Between those two methods, they account for 80% of the tons that we're going to uh, generate. And uh, certainly, yes, those stopes will have to be filled with, uh, with backfill material from the, uh, the mill and the paste fill plant that we actually have in the mill. The other mining methods as well, cut and fill, whether it's underhand or overhand, you have to be mining under paste or on top of the paste. So again, more tailings goes underground. And the same is true of the mass blast raised mining. I believe in the feasibility study, we've uh, ratioed it that 50% of the tails goes underground and 50% go, goes into the pond. There is an opportunity probably to put more paste underground than what we have designed. And that could obviously mean that the ultimate size of the pond is smaller than what we're ultimately envisaging and, and would minimize future capital costs. So the test trial mining we did in 2018 had long hole and sub-level up uppers. Remember, we got a 14% positive reconciliation to the resource. So uh, we were that, in our opinion, gave the new resource model and the geological structural model some validation and credibility. And those are our two uh, principal mining methods. Once we go mining seven months after green lighting the project, we will have to have the paste fill plant operational. But the good news is, is that the plant is already in the mill. It's been installed. Uh, and there are two lined boreholes outside of the mill uh, that are ready to go. We just need to make the connections from those holes and through the building into the paste fill plant. So the commissioning of that plant can occur within, you know, two to three months of uh, of starting up the mill. And uh, how, how, like, how extensive was that the latest bulk sample program? Do you remember, like, in terms of our production, maybe? Yep, it was very extensive. Um, given the reputation and the legacy issues that you know the former company had suffered. We really, you know, went to the nth degree, uh, you know, ensuring that we did a proper uh, reconciliation exercise. So we mined in total 40,000 tons, and there was 5,000 tons of waste that went through the mill, given that it hadn't operated at that point in time, at least for a couple of years. So we wanted to get the mill operational. We then ran through 5,000 tons of low-grade material, sub three gram per ton because the mill had formerly been cleaned out. So any gold mill will actually absorb some of the gold within its system. So we wanted to get that material through. And then there was 30,000 tons that came from three stoping blocks, 10,000 tons each. Underground, there was over 10,000 underground run of mine muck samples. Each stope was mined completely independently of one another meaning that there was no commingling of the ore. All the ore passes were cleaned out before we put muck from the next stope in, and each stope was stored on its own separate stockpile on surface and was ran through the mill separately. We brought in Golder and Associates to do a complete third-party independent reconciliation exercise. And today in our data room, there's plus or minus a 27-page professional engineers report, which is stamped verifying the numbers and saying that we use best practices and the results are fair and reasonable. We recovered 4,900 ounces of gold versus approximately 4,500, 4,400 ounces, what the model predicted. And that was the 14% positive reconciliation that we got, 7% better on tons and 6% higher on grade. And I think the recovered, the head grade that we saw going into the mill, 
was four and a half grams at that point in time. Thank you, Campbell. How different, uh, George, uh, is your feasibility, or what are the main differences with your feasibility versus that of the previous oper the previous uh, operator? What's the, well, the big approach that's that's making this? Uh, well, it's it, it, it's a great question, but that's one of the problems of of the old company, and that there was never a pre fees or feasibility study conducted. It's one of the fundamental errors that the former management had, and that they rushed the project close to commercial production, building off of preliminary economic assessments. So PEAs can have a level of accuracy of plus or minus 50%, and you don't have reserves. You're dealing with an, potentially an inferred resource, and that's exactly what happened here. So the three and a half million ounces that they were reporting was 2.2 million ounces of that was inferred, and the average drill density was 55 meters. Now we have a feasibility study with a level of accuracy of plus or minus 10%, and all the numbers are supported by real quotes from vendors and suppliers. Plus the last four years, we have all the operating parameters of the mine. So we know what we pay the mine manager. We know what we pay for explosives. I know what I pay for propane. I know what I pay for diesel. So these are real numbers supporting the, 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 the metrics. And of course, we have reserves. The measured and indicated, which is now proven and probable, is drilled off on average at a 17 meter drill density, which is three times tighter than the 55 meters that was drilled four or five years ago. That's why we have more confidence today in the numbers that we're putting out compared to four years ago. It's not that we're any different than any other company that releases a bankable feasibility study, but it's really that in the past, shortcuts were taken and ultimately the former shareholders of the company paid for it. Um, also, just for the benefit of the layman, uh, looking at the, this picture, you're surrounded by a lot of water. Uh, you have a tailings facility uh, there. Uh, how secure and stable is this mining environment? Well, the good news is, is that when you physically go into the mine today and, and the actual F2, the Bateman Gold Mine mineralization actually extends out directly mm -hmm. under the lake. Uh, the mine is actually extremely dry. So that tells us that the rock competency above us, you know, is not porous. It doesn't act as a natural sort of conductor for the, uh, for the water and there's no big fault structures. Also, when they did the initial discovery holes, all the holes would have been filled or cased with, uh, with cement. So it doesn't act as a conduit for water to egress or ingress and in, into the mine. The other thing we do is underground when we develop in the higher level areas, we always do cover drilling ahead of ourselves. So we drill you know, 50 feet, 60 feet ahead of the face looking for water. If ever we have encountered any water in a small hole, we would grout that whole area to ensure that no water com comes in. Plus all our development plans are, we have the diamond drill holes from surface, they all have to be marked on the plan so we know when we're getting close to intercepting a hole. The other thing that happens, Campbell, in mining terms is there's what's known as a crown pillar, which is usually about, in our cases, 50 meters below the bottom level of, of the lake bed. That doesn't get mined. We leave that, even though there's mineralization in that crown pillar, that doesn't get mined over the seven, eight years of the mine life. As you get towards the end of the ultimate mine life, some miners will go in and mine the top of the crown pillar and take out whatever gold they can without imp impacting the factor of safety or you know the health and safety of the employees. But that's always the last thing that you do as you are closing up the mine. And that's how we mitigate the risk of uh, water uh, ingressing uh, into the mine. Thank you. Thank you. And you mentioned before in the project finance 
you know, I know some country, some companies, albeit in different countries, have had issues because they can't conduct site visit with the lenders. Um, so how has that impacted you, got, you guys? Um, and, you know, getting Canadian banks or, you know, banks with Canadian staff versus, you yeah. know, lenders yeah. who don't have anything in Canada? Yeah, so it's a good question. So a year ago, we were looking a year or so ahead about the financing of this project. And of course, we were in a little bit of a, 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 a less robust gold price environment. So we were already thinking a year ahead about, you know, strategic partners, financiers. So in the last year before COVID actually hit, we've had various groups come up to the site and already do site inspections and due diligence. So, you know, to a lot of extent, that's already been taken care of. At site, however, we, we currently do have strict protocols in place, but in the last couple of months, we have allowed visitors to come in on site, provided that they can drive into the property and don't have to go through airports or travel on planes, and that they have to have a COVID test completed before they come in on site, and it must come back negative before they're allowed on the property. And then, of course, I don't want to go into all the details, but there are strict social distancing and masks that are mandatory, must be worn while on the property. So I think we've very much taken care of it with what we've did in the last 12 months, but there are some new groups in there that haven't been to site, and I'm quietly confident that we can uh, support any site visits should they desire them between now and the end of the year. Yeah, very good. And then first up, you mentioned the new staff hires. Given how much activity is going on in the gold space globally, but in Canada and specifically um, the Red Lake District, you know, what's the kind of key pitch for securing some of these top quality people from bigger companies from your point? People want to work with George Ogilvy, believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> they might not understand my accent, but for some reason they want to work with George Ogilvy. But look, uh, the other thing is, I mean, people recognize that this company is very much undervalued. Um, if we were able to turn this around and put it into commercial production, you know, five years ago, this story was a head, this company was a headline story given, you know, how it sort of crashed and burned. This could be one of the greatest turnarounds in Canadian mining history. And there are a lot of people out there who want to be part of that successful team and be part of Canadian history. Um, so we, we have not had any issues in attracting top quality people to this company. And of course, as we move down the ranks, one of the key things in Red Lake is we actually have a 200 man camp. Because one of the things about recruiting people to Red Lake is you might be able to get people to want to come there. But the housing, there's limited housing in the town. And right now with the level of activity that's occurring there, the hotels are full, there's no rental space at all, and any houses that are available are, are quite um, uh, pricey for that particular area. So fortunately, we've already got that 200 man camp there, which we're busy preparing the first 100 beds to start accommodating people uh, early in the new year. Yeah, exciting. And then I've got one last question for I pass back to Campbell. So tax pool losses relating to an acquisition, like my understanding, I guess probably from Australian rules, but it only applies for acquisitions in the same industry code, like you couldn't buy you know, a tech company. So how, what are, what are the rules around utilizing your tax losses for an acquisition? Yeah, um, it's not my area of expertise, but the, the little that I do know in Canada, uh, other sectors, other companies uh, could use those uh, tax loss pools. So if we went and wanted to acquire an IT or a tech company, we could certainly do that. The biggest bang we get for our buck though with the tax pools is actually doing an acquisition with another company or with assets that are in Ontario. Because of that $750 million of tax pools, there are federal pools, but there's also provincial pools. So if we did an acquisition in BC, yes, it could be accretive and there would be benefits, 
but we can't access the Ontario provincial pools that we have. So our best bang for our buck is to look at something uh, in, in Ontario. But in a nutshell, if you have project A, which is in Ontario, and it's after tax, uh, NPV is $100 million lower than the pre-tax NPV, if we were able to do a, a, a merger there or an acquisition, which was accretive for both sets of shareholders, we would be able to apply a significant portion of our tax pools and bring them forward in time. And essentially the NPV on that project after tax would just improve by a hundred million dollars in value. Yeah, okay, makes sense. Uh, I want to thank everyone for tuning in and for your great questions. And uh, please, we'll be queuing you for some feedback uh, when you log out. Please share a few lines. They'll make their way to, to uh, the company and uh, follow uh, Battle North and uh, and Vest Capital on uh, LinkedIn and uh, Battle North on on Twitter as well. So uh, with that, a, a closing statement, George. Well, I'd like to again thank you and your team for the opportunity here to uh, to present. Um, hopefully, people can see that this company, uh, you know, is significantly undervalued. And if you've followed the company over my four-year tenure, you'll know that we always deliver on what we say we're going to do. Uh, so I would say, you know, if you're still skeptical, watch this space, and uh, we will be pouring gold dory bars within the next uh, 12 months and have a fully funded project within the next two months. Great, thank you. Good day. Thanks, George. Thank you.